God give us Christian homes, homes where the Bible is loved and taught, homes where the Master's will is sought, homes crowned with beauty your love has wrought. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. Homes where the Father is true and strong. Homes that are free from the blight of wrong. Homes that are joyous with love and song. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. Homes where the mother in caring quest strives to show others your way is best. Homes where the Lord is on home, not guest. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. Homes where the children are led to know Christ in his beauty who loves them so. Homes where the altar fires burn and glow. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes. We can all echo amen to that. May God give us a Christian home. As we look forward to a time of refreshing, I will hand over to the chairperson of the committee, Sister Miriam Panganai. Thank you, Brother Francis. We thank God for this program. I'm going to ask Brother Guest to open for us in prayer, please. We thank you today because you are God. Amen. It has pleased please you to gather us this way um, today, and especially this year. Oh Lord, we just say thank you. Amen. Thank you for the situation that we are passing through at the moment, because you said in everything we should give thanks. Yes. Because you are God, Amen. and with you nothing is, pos is impossible. Amen. Oh Lord, please come and accept our thanks and praises. Amen. Even this pandemic that seemed to have changed everything all around us, but you are God that never changed. Amen. You remain the same, and you will remain the same forever. Amen. Oh Lord, today we are just calling upon you that you come down and Amen. bless every family. Amen. Amen. Western Europe and beyond. Amen. And today, Lord, we will see your mighty hands upon our families. Amen. And all those families that have been experiencing difficult times, that from today, those difficulties will be over. Amen. And that, oh Lord, as you spoke light, you mm. commanded light to, to be when you were creating this earth, when there was everywhere gloominess, and as light came, 
and that everything was perfect. After mm -hmm. as you started your creation, it was always said everything was good. So long from today, from today on, every family, every family of God, we just want everything to be good. Amen. Jesus, the light of the world, we just want you to come and shine today. Amen. And every line of everything we're going to be that is going to be done today, Lord, that you will be in it. Amen. That Lord, you will so much feel our guest speaker, mm -hmm. and that Lord, at the end of this occasion today, we will all rejoice and have every cause to glorify your name. Amen. So Lord, it doesn't really matter that we are meeting virtually today. Amen. And Lord, as you said to the, the, the king of Israel, that because Ben Hadad has said, you are only the God of the valley. Oh, Lord, you said you are going to show that you are the God of the hills and the God of the valley. Yes. Oh, Lord, and no matter you, whatever means we meet, that you will be in our midst. Amen. That you are today going to be present in our midst. Amen. Amen. Let miracles start, start to happen in every family from Amen. now on. Amen. Jesus, Father, and because a blessing, Amen. we thank you for everything. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Uh, but we want to start off and introduce that we are having a program where we will have an icebreaker, some videos. This is a, a program where we want everybody to participate. So please feel free to participate. We will have breakout rooms and then later on we'll have the question and answer session with Brother Bill so, and the other ministers from our church. So please welcome, feel free. It's an easygoing opportunity for us to meet over Zoom. So we thank God for this opportunity. So I'm handing over to those that are giving us an icebreaker. Good afternoon, Preston. Are you How are you? I, I'm super excited. You know, when something comes about family, especially this time. And I just thank God for this opportunity the minister has given us to meet again as a family. But before we get into the grips of, uh, you know, the whole program, we need to have some, you know, ice breakfast. <laughs> but I know you, I know you for certain, Sister Tossi. You are such a big kid. And yeah, you like yeah. games. I like games too. The first game, we're going to have uh, ages 6 to 12. Do we have anybody ages 6 to 12? In this okay. chat, six to twelve. All six ages to twelve. Can I? See, can you see who is oh, that? I need four. I need four. Yeah, they're getting there. They're getting there. We've got who? We've got um, Elizabeth from Leicester. Yes. Yep. Who else? Yep. Ethel family there. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, who else? How many have we got now? Two? Yeah, we've got a few. We've got a few. Okay, that's fine. So the rules of the game, the rules of the game, I want to take, look for plain sheets of paper. And I want you, I'm requesting you to write one mom, another one, dad. Okay? Remember, mom or dad. And whilst we're preparing for that, we'll come back to you and do the game. And Sister Tosin, tell us what's going to happen whilst they're preparing. All right. So ages 6 to 12, make sure you've got a piece of paper doing this nice and bold, mum and dad. We'll give you a few minutes to do that. While 6 to 12 are doing that, we want 9 to 16. Sorry, 13 to 16. Ages 13 to 16. You don't need anything about you. All you need is to have fast feet and quick thinking. So 13 to 16, if you can spell family, F-A-M-I-L-Y, you have approximately about three minutes to go around your house and whoever comes back first, finding items that begin with the letter F, the letter A, the letter M, the letter I, the letter L and the letter Y items around your house that begin with those letters whoever comes back first you want to sit down the winner and you get prizes you get prizes that will be posted out to your house 9 to 16 we're waiting for you f a m i l y items around the house i've got all of them no you need the whole thing no cheating 
the yes. eyes. We've got all of them as well. Who's that? Who's got back? Just put your hand up in the in the chat. Hey, Dairo's on point. They're back. <laughs> Are you guys sure? Mums and dads, no cheating. There's Dami Tommy from Manchester as well. Nice one. I cannot believe it. They've done it in sort of like half the time. <laughs> Do you want us to show it? No. In a minute, let's give everybody no. the time. We know who's first. All right, time up. Can I see your items? F. Flowers. Okay. Dairos. A. And then a mug. A mug. An iPhone for eyes. A lemon for L. I'm interested in the Y. And then yogurt for Y. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Vanderoas, please. F, I've got a face mask. Nice. A. I've got an apple. Nice. Okay. Love it. Love it. M. For M, a mask. Nice. But I in the me. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, L. A light. Great. And why? Why? Yogurt. Fantastic. Yeah, yogurt. Yogurt was my thing. Thank you very much. 13s to 16s. Um, the other ones that had their hands up, Avery, if we can just make a note of them. We'll make sure you get all your prizes sent out to you. So we'll try and get your details. Um, bro, Stan, over to you. Okay, here comes the first question. Who tucks you in bed? Um, Mom or dad? Nice, okay. we've got them. Mom's Mom, a bit busy. Mom. On, this, on this question, Mom is winning. I Mom. So. Oh, yeah, Mom. Yeah. Mom. Mom, we've got dad one. <laughs> Mums and dads, please don't give them the answers. Let don't them give them the answers. answers. Be honest. Don't worry. Show you don't worry. Yes, On this question, oh, mom is winning. Okay. The next question is, who is quick to apologize to you? Who is quick to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, my darling. Uh, Let's have a look. Let's have a look. I see dads. Wow. Mom. Oh, dads. Dad. Dad, I can see that. Oh, on this one, we can see 50 50. 50, 50. Yes. Next, the next one is who always says, Well done. Let's have a look. Oh, the FA family, mom and dad, both of them. Wonderful. Who always takes you to play at the park? Oh, mom. Mom, I did dad. Oh, I see dad. I see dad's see there. Dad, you see dad? Yeah. But I think moms are winning, you know. Moms are winning, you know. I'm seeing but... quite a few dads. I'm seeing quite have a few you? dads too. Yeah. The next one, listen to the next <laughs> one. <laughs> Who helps you with homework more? <laughs> Mom, dad, mom are doing a fantastic job on homework. <laughs> the next one, who buys you what you want, oh, no. mom or dad? Oh, they're thinking wow. about this one. I think this one's taking a bit longer. They're thinking. Oh, dad. Thinking. Okay. I can see some that mom and dad yeah, at once. Yeah, I, think dad's, I think dads have won this one. On dad. Okay, the next one. Who always reads you bedtime stories? Bedtime stories? Who read bedtime stories? Some Dad. are still thinking. <gasps> Dads, really? Dairos, it's I'm mom. So Dad. Have you? I can see a little dad. I can see mom. Yeah, I can see I can see lots of dads. Can you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, wow. Family, family from Spain. Dad, dad, dad. Nice. Okay, the next one. Who takes you to school? Mom and dad. Mom and dad, yes. Mm. Let's check. 50-50 uh, on this one, 50 /50 I think. 50 on this one. Okay, the next one. Who says, I love you more? Ooh. Quickly. Oh, mom. Wow. 
Oh, we got two. Mom and dad. I see oh, lots of mom I, and This dad. one I can see mom. Mom, mom. Oh, yeah. Can you see? Yep, I see okay. mom. Let's go to another one. Which parent is more funny? Which parent makes you laugh? I can see that. Yeah, it's I haven't to be seen like... the Aki family. No. 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 Uh, the dad is upside down and Aki family, so I think you're not so there. sure. There's a few mums in there. Eh? A few mums in there. Eh? I've got the <laughs> final one. The final one. Which parent has the most? Shoes, mom or dad? <laughs> Let's see. Mom's got to win this one. Hey, mom has hands down. Hands down. Mom's win this one. That's the final question. We've done super well. So well done, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for participating. So we're getting to another next one. Right. So this is a final game and this is for everybody for everybody in your homes you need a pen and a piece of paper that's all you need i'm going to display some letters and you have 90 seconds to come up with as many words as you can with the letters that you see whoever has the longest words is the winner now if you challenge when that person is um, reading out their word you can challenge if you think that you've they've said the word twice or they've said a word with the letter that's not there so you can challenge but you've got 90 seconds i'm going to display the letters can everybody see the letters coming up now fantastic okay so you've got 90 seconds to come up with as many words as you can your 90 seconds starts now about 10 seconds left time up okay who has the most words unmute and just say anybody get more than 10 uh, 14. yes 14. anybody more than 14 yeah. yeah i got 17 19. oh i heard 19 anybody more than 19 yes <laughs> who I has more 14. than 19 please we have 29. Hey, 29. 21. <laughs> 20. I have 21. Absolutely not. Anybody more than 21? Yes. Uh -uh. Who has more than 21, please? Me, me, me. Just How many Yes. How many, please? 28. 29. 29. Okay, the person who has 29, can you please read out your words? Okay. Um, integrity. Ah? Huh? Novel. In hey. Novel. Student. Sorry, I'm challenging that. There's no yeah. G there. Integrity, you there's no G. Meant to, they meant to use the words. Ah. Integrity. There's no Novel. G. Not G. No ah. G. Ink, ink. Okay, keep, keep going. Keep going. Students. Van, scholar, understanding, love, endurance, orange, doing, ink, fish, and uniform, <laughs> umbrella. They're just using sun. single words. No. No. You're meant to use all the words to form. No, something. you don't need to use all the letters. Oh, oh okay, oh. sorry. But you use some of the letters. Isn't yeah, it? some of them. Some okay. of them. Okay. Did I go okay. on? Okay. Yeah. yeah, please go on, Ma. We only have one N, isn't it? And yeah. they have used no, the two word. ends, two ends. Two ends, okay. Oh. Keep going, Ma. Four. Van. That is Van, sorry. F A N Fan. Jog. Bag. Hotel. Dolly. <laughs> And look. Look, there's only one O there. Okay, we have it. one more round. I'll just clarify. You're only allowed to use the letters that you see there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. One more round. Let me just mix the letters up. Your 90 seconds starts. Can 
Can everybody see? Yeah. yeah. Your 90 seconds starts now. Now. Halfway now. Quick. 10 seconds. Time up. Anybody have more than 20 words? Anybody? anybody? I have 21. I have 21. Okay, you said 21. 21. This is 21. I have 21. I have 21 as well. Okay, Sister Shoman. I, I have 22. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the person who has 22, real quick, if you can read out your words. <clears throat> time. Okay. Um, let, loot, pet, Peter, letter, doe, trout, root, rut, deep, leper, road, roll, toe, lit, light with the L I T E, root, two, two with the double O, old, O D E, older. Game over. Oh, no. <laughs> That's right. Thank you very much, everyone. We'll take them as the winners. We're going to move on now. Um, God bless you as we continue. We now have some um, videos that would like to share with you to carry on with the program. God bless. Uh, home. Like friendship? Uh, children. Children. Patience. Unity. Love. 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 Disappointment. Oppression. Yeah. Overbearing. Problems. Problems. Arguing. Dysfunctional. Load of trouble. Commitment. Conflict. Stress. Judgmental. Exasperating. <laughs> there is harmony inside the family. Give you the honest truth, maybe sometimes too much. Everything. Everything. Family is loving each other. Family is accepting each other for who you are. A group of people that come together with common values, that love each other, that support each other, that hold each other accountable for the success of the whole family. I love my family because they care about me. Family is about caring and supporting one another through all of life's ups and downs. Sometimes they can get on your nerves, but you always have to love them back. Having patience and always being loved. Family is not an important thing. It is everything. Family to me means always knowing that you have people there for you and no matter what. Family to me is a bond that cannot be broken. Feel like you're appreciated. Family means a lot to me because I love you. Family is somewhat chaotic with 11 brothers and sisters. Peace, togetherness, happiness, joy, relationships. Family is an unpredictable journey shared with those you love. They share in our memories, good and bad, and in our plans for the future. My community is my family, and family is everybody. Family means love. It means unconditional love. It means support. Family are those with which you have an irrevocable bond. They're people that you stand by regardless. The people that you spend a lot of time with, uh, those that you would sacrifice for, that you think of above and beyond. Family is widespread. Family is amazing. Togetherness. My family is us. Family is love. Caring. Family is fun. Patience. Family is an adventure. You know, when I think of my family, I think about the experiences we have together. Each and every day, we grow closer through the good times and the bad times. But it really all comes down to the relationships we have with each other. It's all about growing each other, supporting each other, and ensuring the success of each one. We are Forney family. You can see Brad Bill already. Um, I'm sure a number of us know Brother Bill. Remember, he was at our camp meeting some years ago. And for those that regularly go to Portland camp meeting, Brad Bill is very well known. Um, mm -hmm. if, if, if you are very observant, when you go to the fellowship center to eat, you will see, uh, see him with his snappy and um, with the man apron tied around his waist, and you see him wiping your table for you. As you finish eating and you're packing your place, he's wiping it. He's making every place um, look neat and clean. God bless Brad Bill. So this afternoon, I want you all to please welcome Brad Bill. Brad Bill is the pastor of our church in Seattle. And um, 
Before then, Brabil has pastored a number of our churches, maybe about four or five. Um, he's been pastoring for about 32 years. And um, Brabil is also on the board. Brabil has been pastoring for about 32 years. As I said, he's been a minister for over 40 years and is a member of the board of trustee of our church. That's the, 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 at the international headquarters in Portland. He's been a member of the board since 2003. And um, in terms of academic qualification, Brabil is very well qualified. He has um, a master's degree. And actually, um, he also has master's degree in biblical studies, theology, and a doctor degree in ministry. Uh, Rabil studied Hebrew and Greek languages. So he's, he's able to interpret the Bible in its original language. Um, the church, uh, not, just the, not just the Seattle church actually, and I think some other churches that Brabil has pastored in the past are multicultural. So Brabil is not strange um, to a multicultural church like our branches here in the UK. Um, as a matter of fact, he told me that sometimes in the Seattle church at the service, they can have as many as 10 different um, nationalities present at the service from about four continents of the world. That is real, um, really, really diverse. So, and Brabil, as some of us are likely to know, is the director of our East Asia churches. He oversees our churches in Philippines, Japan, and South Korea. So once again, I want us to welcome him, Brabil, a father of um, three children, and he's a grandfather too. So he's very well qualified to speak to us on what a family setting should be and what the heart of God is for a family. Brabil, on behalf of Brazic and the entire ministry, we welcome you to this event. God bless you. The floor is yours. Thank you, Brother Francis. It's a joy to be with you today. It is uh, it's early in the morning in Seattle. I know. Uh, in fact, as I glance out my office window, it's not yet light. But yeah. we're glad to be with you here today. And, uh, and uh, we're, we're praying that in our short time together that not only will we gain some uh, wisdom from God's word, but we'll also... Uh, we'll also uh, have a good time. I was thinking as uh, Brother Stan and Sister Toyin did their opener of 29 words. That's 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 quite a bit. I I just did a little check here on my uh, on my uh, document that I'm uh, speaking from today, and I've got closer to 3,000, and I have to fit those all into 30 minutes. So I'll do my best to do that. Um, we'll see if we can fit the, uh, we, we can also share uh, a little PowerPoint with you, uh, but I'm first gonna have to um, see if Brother Francis will um, enable me to be able to share, <laughs> um, to share my- uh, If you please. Um, to share my PowerPoint. So what, what, when we do that, yeah. hello, I'm here, hang on. When, when we do that, then I'll do my best to share the screen that I have. Yeah, um, if we kindly um, make Brabil a co-host. Yeah, okay, you can share now, Brabil. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Let's see if we can get where we need to do. I think that's what I wanna share. Let's see, hang on. There, oh, now you're seeing my picture and that picture. How about if we close that are we almost there We're almost there hang on and if i do that there you have it how's that everyone see yeah. great great well I, I was um i have many more memories from seeing you some of you back in uh, in the uk when we were there in 2016 and uh and beyond that uh i'm gonna work on the technology here again let's see I want to make that a smaller window because then I'll be able to see better. There we go. We're getting it. Don't panic. You know, isn't this wonderful in this time of COVID? All the all the new uh, technology that we have to deal with. 
Um, I never thought that I would be a, a full-time uh, TV preacher, but for months we were. We were able to have services here now in Seattle on a limited basis, and that's a, and that's a good thing. Oh, we want to be going backwards, not forwards. There we go. Here's, there we go. That's where I want you to be. So uh, you heard Brother Francis give you a little bit of my vita and the like. And uh, wh what I do want to tell you is that um, the thing that he can't share with you is my heart. So I'm going to start with that because since the topic of our uh, presentation today is God's heart, I thought you might like to hear a little bit of mine. And uh, first of all, I really love Jesus. If you haven't figured that out, you don't know me very well. Now, I also really love my family. And, and I also really love and have loved for years various cultures and uh, nationalities and how they interact together and particularly in the context of the gospel. And so I, I've been at this for a while and uh, I, I was thinking about something my first pastor said to me and that's over 40 years ago. And, and he pointed to his gray hair and, and he he said, which of course is now the same as mine today. And he said, this does not mean that I'm wise, but it does mean that I've had a chance to be wise. And so hopefully today we can, uh, we can discover some of God's wisdom and, and some ways in which we can apply it to our own heart. But so, so we're going to start with this question. What can you expect and why should you listen to the presentation today? And uh, uh, what you can expect today first of all, is four points in this uh, time that we have together. And the first point is uh, God's design for the family. The second point is a few foundation stones that we can build on. Um, you know, it, it's a little humorous that we try to, to establish the entire family uh, d design and God's heart for it in 30 minutes, <laughs> but, but we will do our best. Uh, beyond that, we'll talk just a little bit about cultural implications and influences on the family. And then ideally, we'll finish with how the church fits into God's design for the family. So those are the four points I hope to get to you here in this, these 30 minutes. Um, I learned this morning when I uh, signed on, that's your afternoon, that there'll be some questions and uh, um had I known that, that uh, I was going to have to field questions, I might have run away. But uh, because certainly I don't have all the answers, but we know that God does. So uh, we're, you go ahead and put your questions in. And I'm sure that people wiser than I will do their best to try to uh, answer them as we can. So God's design for the family. Uh, well, let's start with this. And uh, and. And maybe what I'll do is go backwards one again, just for good measure here. Um, have you ever stopped to consider that, that the only perfect parent was God the Father? And, and that perfect parent created a perfect environment in which to raise his children. And he placed Adam and Eve in that perfect environment and then he was an abject failure. Now I have to be careful about that because of course God the Father was not a failure at all. It was the failure of the children. And, and we know the story is the fall and Adam and Eve entered into sin and they plunged all of us from what was ideal into a world that is less than ideal. So when we say we're looking for the ideal family, it makes me chuckle a little because we, God started with an ideal situation and people didn't handle it very well. We're starting with a much less than ideal situation. And sometimes we get frustrated when it's not ideal. So, so uh, I, with that said, and living in a less than ideal world, God does have a design for families. And the foundation of that would be a Christian husband and wife ideally followed by children. And, and we know because of a variety of issues, sickness, violence, war, divorce, sinful choices, that sometimes that ideal is not achievable. 
But that doesn't mean that a, a remaining spouse, like a widow, or the remaining parent, any less than ideal in God's eyes. We know that in our current cultural malaise, there's lots of confusion about families. Biblically, we have to understand that all people have intrinsic value in God's eyes and God's heart as his creation, no matter what their choices are about family. And yet, even though the culture around the world has it messed up in many ways, God does have a specific design in his word. A husband and a wife, followed by children. Um, the other models that are in the society, no matter how prevalent they are, how popular they are, how, how much social influence uh, they have, whether they're legal or not, those are not God's design. And we just need to know that. Now, my oldest daughter is a uh, teacher by training. <coughs> Excuse me. And she has three uh, ch uh, children ranging in age from 10 down to uh, seven. And those children attend public school in the Seattle area. And uh, it's quite fascinating. Uh, she, they come home with lots of questions. You know, mom, my friend's family isn't like our family. My friend's family is, is different. Uh, and, and, and that, those questions come up, and I'm sure they come up there in the UK and wherever else anyone's listening from. And so this quote is, is from actually from my daughter, and it is given with permission. And I really love the way that it addresses this to begin with. Uh, we as Christians, uh, if we start out with this, I think, and, and remember, this was aimed at a 10-year-old and an and a, a eight-year-old and a seven-year-old. And she tells them, God has a loving design for families. There are lots of ways that people have chosen to not follow God's design. And those all break God's heart. Sometimes there are times or places when a parent treats their spouse or child in a way which is not safe or healthy. And then hard decisions, oh, they're disappeared. Uh, hard decisions have to be made to protect everyone. Other times people just choose to intentionally to enter into relationships which are outside God's design. And while we know God's design, it remains God's responsibility to correct others. Now remember, this is a mom teaching her children and she's telling them it's not your job at the age of 10 or eight to take on all your friends at school and announce to them that their families are messed up. But it is our responsibility as Christian families, and this specifically applies to us as parents, uh, but to live out God's design with love and grace and the light with which he intended. When we do that, we don't have to argue against the other ways that families uh, are happening in the world today. People will see that God's design is the best. So I, I like the way that she said that, and I thought that was a good way to start. Uh, we're going to move on with some foundation stones, and, and, and I have three of them today. And the, the foundation stones uh, all begin with, a am going to call a, it a caveat, or a, a, we, we all understand that God's word is the uh, basis for everything that we as Christians uh, do, uh, family, business, raising children, uh, interactions with the rest of the world, but it, it's been said that the very best way for a man to raise his children is to love their mother. Now, that to some of us seems so basic that we wouldn't even say it, but we live in a world now where people uh, are questioning whether there is actually a need for both a father and a mother. We live in a world today whether where it's questioned whether uh, how those two uh, necessary parents should actually be treating each other. And so when we look at God's design, I want you to remember that we're, we as husbands, and I can speak only as a man, uh, are called to love our wives. And that's the very, the very best thing we can do first for our children. So, Foundation stone number one, you find it in Genesis 2.24, and 
and I suspect most of you can quote this. Um, and, and this is uh, the Lord speaking in the book of Genesis, recorded by Moses, talking about how, how a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain will become one flesh. Now, the scripture is also quoted by uh, the Lord Jesus when he's talking about marriage. It's also quoted by the Apostle Paul, and I use it in all my premarital counseling, and I define it in basically three ways. Uh, I, I, I use the, the uh, um, meme or whatever you want to call it, leave, weave, a cleave, excuse me, and weave. You can divide the scripture into those three portions. And uh, my experience over the years has been when problems erupt in a marriage, it is very often because one of those three basic principles has been violated. So I'll cover those just shortly for you. Leaving means, and, and there's a cultural context, uh, but it means that all other relationships, human relationships, must be subservient to the new covenant relationship between a man and a woman in marriage. Now, we, we still honor and respect our parents and we enjoy our friends, but according to God's word, they must now become secondary. And the relationship between a husband and a wife intertwined with the relationship with God must become primary. Um, I often say in the, in the marriage ceremonies that I perform, an invisible circle is drawn around you too. All others are excluded. Now, the moment that you allow others into that intimate circle between husband and wife and God, then we have a problem. And we've violated God's word. The word cleave, of course, According to Webster's Online Dictionary, it's an old English word, means to adhere firmly and closely or loyalty, uh, loyally and unwaveringly to something. And I often use the example of two pieces of wood which are glued together. And, the, and besides the glue, they are exerting pressure toward each other. So it's like this. And, and that bond is so tight that should the piece of wood be broken, it will break somewhere other than the joint. It will not break there. That's what cleaving is. This is a, the intentional will that human beings exert to continue to make a strong, consistent choice to stay together, no matter the circumstances and no matter the, uh, uh, how we happen to feel at this moment. We live in a world that's based on feeling. And God's word supersedes what your and my feelings are. The third part is weave. And, and that I've, I've used that word to talk about when the scripture talks about becoming one flesh. And, and literally, this is the intentional and ongoing interweaving of two lives together. Putting two into one. Now, it begins with mutual interests and goals, and it continues throughout married life. Conscious, intentional choices over and over and over to build a strong interdependence in a relationship. Now, now it might it, it might be just choices that will support the strength of the uh, the relationship, uh, faithfulness to each other, um, and to the Lord. Choices that might choose that over wealth or career or position, uh, the position of either of the members. Um, so that, that's foundation stone one. And it, it seems that if we start here, that's, that's where Jesus started. That's also where Paul started, that we can't hardly go wrong. Foundation stone two, another familiar scripture, is found in Ephesians 5, 21 to 33. Now, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to spend uh, my time reading all of this because you have Bibles and you can go back uh, to that. But I will let you know that there are three basic points in this scripture. And, and the first is what I like to call mutual submission. Oftentimes this is missed in this uh, particular scripture, but 
Verse 21 talks about how each of us as Christian believers, husbands and wives and uh, saints uh, in general, are to be submissive one to another. That, that was an intentional pause there for you to think about that. Um, no one likes in our human nature, I think, to be submissive. Uh, we, I say here, when, when you talk to the uh, children, when they're gathered at school and here now they're all gathering virtually, so maybe on Zoom meetings it's the same, but when you ask them to, uh, to line up, it seems like there are always more children who want to be the line leader than want to be in the middle of the line somewhere. You know, hands go up everywhere. And, and, and really, it doesn't matter. Uh, personality is part of it, but it's not just personality. But the scripture very clearly starts out that we as Christians have to learn how to submit. That would be husbands and wives. Now, the scripture goes on, of course, uh, to speak specifically to husbands and their responsibilities and to wives and their responsibilities. And, and I always uh, tell young couples, and maybe I ought to remind older couples, that the, this particular scripture is never meant to be weaponized toward the other spouse. When you read this scripture, you need to read the part that applies to you and not the part that applies to your spouse. When you get the part that applies to you under control, then you can talk. So the, the gentlemen are, are men, and, and I'm talking to young men too who have yet to become spouses, but this is, a, this is what a godly woman is looking for in a spouse. Men are called to what I call loving sacrificial leadership. They are called to love their wives as Christ loved the church. There's no question that in God's economy, oftentimes men are called to lead. Does not, does not minimize the fact that women are well qualified to lead in many cases. Uh, so please, we're, we're not arguing that. But, but men are called to lead and, and they are called to do that in a loving and sacrificial way. Now, that, that would preclude a man from announcing, I'm in charge here, and therefore the Bible says, you must listen to me. That doesn't sound very loving, nor does that sound very sacrificial. Um, maybe I should leave it there, but I guess I'm the guest speaker, so I'll push a little bit. Uh, whenever a man is leading in his home, in his church, in, in, uh, in his family, with his children, his model is always Christ, and, and Christ always, he taught, he lived, he encouraged, and, and, and it was always in a loving and sacrificial way, leading correctly. That's what we as husbands and men in general are called to do. We live in a society that is, that is absent leaders that lead sacrificially and with love. Well, ladies, we don't want to leave you, leave you out, and um, this brings you to, a, a, I call it a, a um, off misquoted scripture where it talks about wives being submissive to their own husbands, and I love to use an example from a musical. The musical is called uh, The Sound of Music. Some of you may or may not have heard it. I hope the example works across the pond here, and uh, the musical was written about uh, a family called the Von Trapps. They were an Austrian family during the Second World War, musical by nature, and during the occupation of Nazi Germany, of Austria, they fled over the mountains. And a famous musical was written about that, them fleeing. Uh, a song was written during that musical that, that expressed very fascinatingly to me their loyalty to their home country which was Austria. That song is entitled Edelweiss, Edelweiss being a, a small little white flower that grows in the Austrian Alps. But also it became a symbol of strength and bravery and independence. And if you read the words of the song, 
the song ends with the words, be my homeland forever. In context, for those of you who have not seen it, it simply, as they sang, was an acknowledgement that even though Austria was occupied and controlled by the Nazis, the Austrians had not submitted to them. I, I use that example simply to point out to you that submission is something that must be given willingly. It cannot be demanded. It cannot be taken. It must be given for it to be effective in a marriage. And so, so again, as I said, women, thank the Lord, have a wonderful capability of responding to loving sacrificial leadership. We are asked as Christians to willingly submit our lives to Christ. And we do that because of his great example. And, and if husbands would take their role seriously, it would be much more simple for wives to take their role more seriously. Now, I, I use an example sometimes uh, to, to discuss the inner workings of this. Uh, as you know, I, I work with our churches in Asia and in Korean culture in particular, uh, honor for elders is very, very high, much like much of African culture. And, and this became actually a problem for them in the airline industry, because in the airline industry, the captain of an airliner had all, not only leadership, but all control. And those that worked with the pilot were um, hesitant to give any input. Now, uh, this extended Claire uh, to the co-pilot, who has the same training as the pilot, has the same ability to fly the plane, knows all of this training, just doesn't have the top job yet, sits in the seat next to the pilot. And, and so how this would play out is if there was a, a tragic uh, equipment failure, an engine on fire, the co-pilot would be hesitant to mention it to the pilot because it would... Uh, it could be perceived as trying to take authority or not honoring the pilot's leadership because he should have noticed it. And, and what happened was the entire plane, including passengers and crew, were put at risk. Actually, it caused some tragic airline accidents. So Korean airlines had to go and speak to their pilots and their other staff about how the culture made the, made the interaction in the cockpit actually unsafe. Now, the way this works in a family simply would be this. I tell husbands, do not let your pride and your, and your uh, understanding of yourself as the leader in a family overwhelm you to the point that when the co-pilot God has given you tells you that there is an engine on fire, that you respond in an unloving way and say, I'm the pilot. Instead, you should say, thank you very much, and turn off the fuel to the fourth engine. Well, there's your example for that one. Foundation stone number three. <laughs> if you're still listening, maybe some of you have turned off by now, but I hope not. Uh, <laughs> we, are, we are with you, Brother Dio. <laughs> Good. We are with you, Brother Dio. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you're with me. Um, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, I, I only make light of that, of course, but you know, sometimes I, I had a pastor say once to me, uh, sometimes when you hear the word of God, you should say, amen. That's true. But he said, also, there are other times when you hear the word of God that in your heart, what you usually say is, ouch, that hurts. Because sometimes God's word, it's quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And, and it, it has to deal with our hearts, and all of our hearts need instruction. Well, the third foundation stone, uh, this one now comes from the book of 1 Peter. It's nine verses, and I won't read it, but it's fairly, it's fairly uh, straightforward. Again, builds on the same foundation that we've had. And it, in the first six or seven verses, it gives 
uh, what I call holistic instruction for wives. P the apostle Peter was married, we know that, and he had some insight into generally how women process information. Now, if we had time today, I could go into the, the neurophysiological reason that oftentimes women process information in a more holistic manner than men, and, and men tend to process information in a more linear manner. Uh, there are some physiological reasons why that is generally true, um, but we'll leave that for another time. But understand that Peter practically understood this. And so when he's talking to wives in general about this willing submission uh, that uh, is supposed to be a foundation in a godly home, uh, he gives them a number of uh, examples for them to consider. In fact, over six verses, he includes how they can win their, their spouses who are unsaved to Christ. He, he speaks about how God greatly values inward purity over outward beauty and accents. Um, he then gives them examples of how the holy women of old trusted God in the same manner. And finally, then he appeals to them by the use of of the patriarch Abraham's wife, Sarah. Now in Jewish culture, Abraham is like the man. There's Abraham and there's Moses. Well, now we're talking about Abraham's wife, Sarah. And uh, she is revered by the Jews, especially Jewish women. And they all knew that without Sarah, the promises to Abraham would not have been fulfilled. So Peter talks to them about how this works out practically in life. There's six verses on it. And so I would suggest to you, you take time to look at those because they're, they're, very, they're very informative. Now, Peter also understands generally how men think. And I said generally, it's not, it, it, this isn't categorically every single man every single time, but men tend to think better with what I call a to-do list. They only get one verse, but it's full of power. And Peter gives them an itemized list on how to make their marriage work. And he starts with this. He says, and this is my paraphrase. He says, stay with them, dwelling with them. We have too many men that leave their families. Now we understand that sometimes there are economic reasons that a man has to go work elsewhere or whatever, but the call of God is for men to stay faithful to their families to stay with them. Children need fathers. They don't need them to be absent. He then goes on to say, uh, knowing them, men are to build an intimate and not just physical relationship with them. When the Bible uses uh, the word uh, to know from the uh, Hebrew, the word is yada, and it literally means an intimacy that is not just physical, uh, that, that same meaning is carried into the Greek here, and Peter uh, points it out. He said, you're supposed to be a student of your wife. You're supposed to know her and what makes her tick. Uh, he then goes on to say you're to honor them. That means when your wife walks in the, in the room, you go, ah. Oh. This is the same word that's used when you're supposed to honor God. You're supposed to honor your wife. And then it says as the weaker vessel in the King James. Uh, I like to use the example here. Uh, in, if I went into the other room here, I could take you to our, our China cabinet, the place where my wife has the special uh, dishes that she serves our guests on. And, and they some of them she has inherited from her grandmother and they are precious to her. And that's the, the sense of this word. A wife is to be treated as precious china, breakable, and not some kind of throwaway, disposable paper plates. We live in a world right now where you can get a lot of takeout food and everything is disposable. Husbands and wives are not meant to be takeout or disposable. They're meant to be precious. Finally, it goes on to say, and then he reminds them that you are heirs together of the grace of life. Christianity is the first religion yeah, starting in Jesus' time and moving to today, where women are elevated 
to equal status in the kingdom, heirs together. When we stand before Jesus, no one will ask whether we're male or female, Jew or Gentile, uh, rich or poor, employer or employee. We're heirs together. And then in, in I, I love Peter's insight here. He finishes in, in the way that, that a, a man dealing with other men only could understand. He says to them, that your prayers be not hindered. He tells the men, do you want your prayers to go through? Then follow this. Turn it around another way. If you don't follow this, pray all you want. You might as well be praying to the ceiling. Your prayers aren't going through. Hmm. Now, those are strong words, but sometimes us men need to have it direct. Someone, need to, someone needs to tell us, hey, you have a responsibility. That is to lovingly and sacrificially lead. Peter tells us exactly how to do it in our own families. Well, there's your three foundation stones. Um, I'm looking at the watch clock here, and we're already pushing past to the end of the time, so I'm going to try to keep things uh, <laughs> moving really quickly. There are a few cultural implications and influences. Um, did you notice my African uh, colors up here? I did that all for you, folks. I did that intentionally. Um, the God's design comes from the Bible. We must realize that. That there are things within cultures, human cultures, even within the raising of children, which are challenging. And it's not just Western culture. Western culture certainly brings its challenges, but literally every culture brings challenges. Each of us is enculturated to, to an, an extent. And so we need to understand, um, we tend to raise children as we were raised. And if you were raised in an unsaved home, then there may be some things that you have to unlearn because you were enculturated by that. Uh, I had a young lady once who was raised in a very abusive home and she had to, when she got saved, of course, God delivered her, but she was fearful when she was raising her own children that she would fall back to that model. So we have to, we have to go to God's word. Um, you know, you, those of you that come from uh, an African uh, heritage understand that, uh, there are different tribal cultures. Uh, I understand that there's a number of them. Uh, a number of you possibly are Yoruba, but I understand we have folks from Zimbabwe and maybe some other uh, African countries. Maybe you're, you're from the Ibu tribe. And uh, years ago, I pastored in Los Angeles, and I actually had uh, folks from the Ibu tribe and also the Yoruba tribe in my congregation. So I had a tribal issue between Africans in an American church that had nine nationalities in it. Welcome to being a pastor. That's how it works sometimes. So, so we need to understand that the gospel always supersedes the culture, Amen. whatever culture it is. But we have to remember that the gospel is what comes from the Bible. It, the gospel in some cases... So sometimes we assume, well, of course it's the gospel. It's what we learned at church, but oftentimes culture is in church too. And, and so we need to understand then, okay, there we go, that all cultural applications are not bad. Sometimes they emphasize biblical principles. For example, should we honor our elders? Well, of course we should. That's very biblical. And in in, uh, I told my, my saints in Korea, uh, honoring elders is a very biblical thing until it gets in the way of other biblical principles. For example, and I will talk about Korea because that makes it easier. You don't have to think that I'm picking on African culture because I'm not. Uh, my Korean saints oftentimes have difficulty listening to pastors that are younger. That sound familiar in some of your cultures? And, and, and I remind them, uh, what, how would you have responded to Moses, who was the youngest in his family? Or to Jacob, who was called by God as the younger brother? 
And, and, and honestly, most of them have never considered that because their culture has almost superseded what they understand the Bible to say. And when it's pointed out from outside, then they've gone, oh, the reality is if we live long enough, we're all going to have to become submissive to someone that is younger than us. Yeah. Now that I have gray hair, my dentist is younger than me. The, uh, the law enforcement officers are younger than me. <laughs> the, uh, um, you know, probably the better preachers in my church are younger than me. <laughs> you know, uh, the better looking people in the church are younger than me. You know, you have to get, you have to, you have to. Now that does not mean that you should not honor elders. The Bible says it and culture says it, but we have to be careful. We also have to understand that not all culture is biblical. And so we must be wise. We have oh, yeah. To be really careful with that. So, uh, so I, I want to give you a couple more examples. Am I okay on brother? I, I'm a little over time, brother uh, Francis. Can I? Yeah, can yes, I please, please carry on, Brad Bill. Please carry, yeah, on. I, carry on. I apologize. I tried to, to tighten this small, but um, uh, several years ago, I traveled to Israel with Sister Lori, and there was a group that was with us, including one Nigerian brother who is an expatriate in the U.S., and, and uh, he, he is, was fairly freshly married and had a new young child. And he approached my wife and asked her if he could have a 30 minute appointment with me. And what he wanted to do was to learn how to raise children. Now my wife literally laughed right in his face. Uh, not, not disrespectfully, but she said, you want him in 30 minutes to teach you what we have been have spent 30 years trying to learn <laughs> but but i'm going to share with you the example that i shared with him i took the 30 minutes and i said to him the very best thing a man can do for his children is to love their mother and his response to me was was very telling he he said yes i think that's true he said, I told my wife, now that we have a child, I think we should stop yelling at each other. I'm going to just let that sit out there for a minute. <laughs> now, now, he told me this. He, this is a godly man, and he's trying to serve the Lord. And, but this tells you maybe how culture may have affected their relationship. Maybe how, how, how the frustration level in them learning how to be a new married couple may have taken them to some places where the volume was higher than it should have been. There could have been maybe a little more loving, sacrificial leadership. There could have been a little more willing submission. But for what that's worth, when the child came along, they went, oh, we better get this right. And so... Uh, I, that made me chuckle a little, but I told them, here is one of the best things that you can do. Love your wife because the values that you teach your children are often caught. They're not taught. And I quoted a scripture from Proverbs 22, 6. Many of you know it. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he'll not depart from it. Now, many people use that as a, as a scripture promise, hanging on to God for their children's salvation. And God bless you for that. It is wisdom literature in the scripture, and so it's really not intended to be a promise directly. It's more an observation about how life works. And, and it, it starts out by saying, train them up. Literally, mold them and carve them. And uh, I always tell people, if you use if you're disciplining children, the motive must always be training. The, the basis of the word disciple and discipline is teaching. So if you're not teaching, if you're responding in a way that is in anger or that is, in, uh, in, is punitive in any way, and it is not aimed at teaching, <coughs> then you've stepped outside what the Bible says you're supposed to be doing. So I actually handed the man a carving, much like you have on the screen in front of you, because we had bought three of these for our children. And they are carved out of olive wood. And I said to him, when the carvers of this 
begin to carve, they knew what the design was. They were trying to carve a picture of Mary, uh, Joseph, Mary, and the baby Jesus. So they knew the design. We know the design that God wants us uh, to have, particularly in the raising of our children. But interestingly enough, there is also a grain to the wood, which makes each of the carvings individual. And I said to this man, you as a father and your wife are to become students of the grain of the wood, so to speak, of your children. Now, our oldest daughter, if, if Sister Laurie and I said to her when she was attempting a task, we don't think you can do that. She was very quick to prove us wrong. She would set her mind and energy at almost any cost to prove that she could do what we said she could not. Interestingly enough, when our second child came along, it was a son. And if we used that same tactic on him, he would fold his arms and say, you're probably right, and walk away from the task, which was exactly the opposite of what we wanted. So we had to learn that the grain of his wood, his personality was different, and we had to use different tactics, still trying to do it according to the design. So there's an example. Um, a second example, and the last example for this, is um, some years ago I was pastoring in a different city than Seattle. And uh, as Brother Francis shared with you, I, I have some uh, African expatriates in most of my urban congregations. And one particular family, a well-educated, godly family, uh, came to me and said, Brother Bill, what's the best piece of advice you can give us now that we're here for raising children? And my advice to them was, you need to remember where you are. Mm. And they kind of looked at me funny. They had three children and I loved them all. I actually dedicated their youngest son. Um, and I said, you now are raising American children. Mm. And they looked at me kind of funny and I said, you're in America. You're raising American children. Your children are going to American schools. Their, their friends are American or other expatriates that are in America. And I said, you're raising American children. Now you are raising them in their case with a Nigerian heritage. Could have been with a Zimbabwean heritage or a South African heritage. Or uh, we actually have a, a family here in Seattle who is from South Korea. So with a South Korean heritage, uh, that may mean that you send them to language school. It may mean that you teach them some things about uh, uh, cultural respect. It may mean that you teach them some things uh, uh, about history that they need to know. But I said, you have to remember where you are. I said, you want to honor the best of your culture and the best of our culture. And I said, but always you have to honor God's plan over yours. Now that particular family at the time told me that they would never buy their daughter a cell phone while she was a teenager. It would just never happen. And I just smiled. Within 18 months, the high school that that young lady was attending had a security issue and the high school was locked down completely and the parents could not contact the children and the children could not contact the parents and the mother was terrified. And within 18 months, guess what happened? The family that would never buy a cell phone for their daughter bought a cell phone for their daughter. Now the daughter was overjoyed because she wanted a cell phone. And that of course brings another whole issue of how you control that and how you make sure that that uh, only godly things are happening on it and all that. But you get the idea. We need to remember where we are. Uh, I told them never, never, uh, I, I mean, pick up the, the, the wonderful part of culture. I, I have had people from Romania, from Korea, from Nigeria, from a variety of cultures, and they all bring wonderful things to the table. But be careful not to honor those above 
God's plan. Well, we'll move along and finish with this. How does the church fit into God's design? Well, there are three institutions in the word of God that uh, it seems that God has sanctioned. And the, the first of those is the family, foundational. The second is the church. The third is the government. We interact with all three of those on a regular basis. And I can't begin today to tell you about all the interactions with all of those. But I will talk to you about how the fact that they're each, by God's plan, designed to work for the benefit and the support of the others, all pointing towards God's kingdom. And ideally, none of them infringes upon the roles of the other. Um, I... Uh, I'm looking again here at my notes just to finish. And I like to, I like to suggest that a family is ideally a small church, a place where people worship together, they learn together, and ideally they act in unity as a community that's following God. So the first church was a family. Now, when God created a, the church, a, a larger church, body of believers, it was not to take the place of the family, but instead to equip and empower the family to do what God has called the family to do, which is to be this microcosm of loving sacrificial leadership and willing submission, setting example, an example for children to understand how we as human beings are called to follow a lovingly sacrificial leader the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are to willingly submit to his leadership. So the church is to empower the family in that kind of a case. So the church is called to nurture and teach and provide an environment where families can fulfill their call before God. And, and in that case, in that case, that means pastors and teachers are to declare the truth in love, not only to the unsaved, but also to encourage the saints to build their houses on the rock, Christ Jesus. We're called to support families in the responsibilities which God has given them. Ideally, not to intrusively enter into that invisible circle which is drawn around them, uh, between them and God, but to challenge them to live according to God's basic order. Well, today, I promised you we'd talk about four points. We talk about God's design. We did that. We talk about foundation stones. I gave you three basic scriptures upon which the family is built. We talked about a few cultural in implications and influences, and I realized we could spend hours on that. And then finally, I gave you just a little idea what the church's responsibility is and how we're supposed to make it uh, work together. Now, I told you beyond that a few stories hopefully with a little wisdom and humor thrown in from a father, a grandfather, a pastor who now has gray hair and who by God's grace is still trying to grow wise. Thank you for the chance that I've had to talk to you all. May the Lord bless you. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, Brabil, um, I'm, I'm sure um, the responses that you got after your presentation will have further reassured you that we were listening to you. Um, actually, it, it, it was like um, you should just continue. As <laughs> yeah, yeah, and asking if you had more to say. Uh, I'm sure that if we're not constrained by time, um, and it's a shame that, that we, we have that constraint. We would have loved to have you say more, and I'm sure that you have a lot more to say. But, well, as I said, this is the foundation that we're laying today. That, that's not to say that we haven't been having family forum, um, but we have decided to give it a different approach. And I am sure that if the lot tarries, a time will come that we might have to invite you back again to give us more from um, your um very rich um record of these things god bless you immensely um, thank you so much just brother. Hand over to the committee now the organizers so that they will take us to the next event thank you
Thank you so much, Brother Bill, and uh, we pray you will come back to give us some more. Thank you, thank you. We are now going into breakout rooms. Uh, we hope we have enjoyed our time in the breakout rooms. Yeah. Have we? Yes. 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 Let's always be ready with the questions to Brother Bill, please. We started out with an easy one, didn't we? <laughs> yes. Can't get any tougher than this. <laughs> yeah, brother Isaac is only laughing because he, well, actually, Amen. actually, let's we'll take it seriously. It's it's not a laughing matter True. at all True. because because at the basis of a question like this is is brokenness yes. and pain and and we as Christians need to take this very seriously and it should break our hearts mm. that the devil uh, can get into a family and create such brokenness. So that's mm. the first place we start. As a church, we start by coming alongside the hurting and the broken. And, and we have to be very wise in doing that uh, because uh, I had a, a pastor tell me once uh, years ago, he said, until you have heard at least two sides of a problem, at least two, sometimes there's more than two, but at least two, you do not know the situation. Now, also, each of those sides comes from a context. You know, each a husband and a wife both come from families. Sometimes there has been abuse or there's been brokenness that happened many years before. And sometimes it's not even, has not been intentional, but it's very much there. We bring that up to the fact that we preach a gospel of transformation, a gospel of reconciliation, a gospel of redemption. And so, so while we come alongside the broken and we come alongside those that are hurt, we also declare to them the truth of God's word in love. And that is that the Lord will restore the years that the locust has taken Amen. and the years that the palmer worm has taken. And Thank the years that, that, that is that, and that it is only God that can do that. Oftentimes, it's also not, uh, it's not a, an, while salvation is instantaneous, as are the other uh, basic experiences, relationships have to be fostered and worked. And, and a broken, a, a, a marriage that's taken years to break down, oftentimes will have to be rebuilt one foundation stone at a time. Uh, it will also take humility uh, uh, on both parts. And it will also take uh, the saints treating both husband and wife with, uh, with kindness and gentleness, and, and, but ideally not becoming an ear mm. to taking sides either way. There's only one side that we want to take, and that side is God's side. Yes. And uh, we do understand that because of, sometimes because of abuse, physical or emotional, uh, or other mental problems, uh, sometimes there are marriages that are divided. That's not the ideal. That's not the norm. It's not what we want. We also have to understand that the ministry has to take some careful, wise choices as to determining how involved mm -hmm. these two individuals might be involved, be in the work if they cannot, if they cannot live within the constraints of what the Bible calls marriage and the covenant there, how they might, what example they might be to be in the work. Doesn't devalue them as people at all. But certainly you would, you would probably not have someone standing in the pulpit or teaching uh, uh, a, a Sunday school class while you have bitterness and brokenness. Now, I'm not suggesting 
that you might not have one partner whose spouse has left them that is now still here and faithful and doing what they're supposed to do. That might be a different issue. And we'd leave that to Brother Isaac and the ministry. But you get an idea. I hope that helps. <clears throat> Back to you. Yeah, I think you go ahead, sir. Razik, you, you wanted to say something to that. Okay. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to Brother Bill. And of course, to say that um, what you said is quite true. The aspect of um, laughing or smiling actually was about your very humorous comment about we are starting with a very easy one. Yeah. Not anything about the question in question. That particular question, as you rightly said, is one that you make us to be sober and to cry to God. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what is um, not stated, perhaps in that question to make it more uh, uh, um, open will be that because it says, how can the church, because the church surely must do something and I think what is lacking in that question is how after the church has done everything possible for such two individuals and still they still didn't want to reconcile. I think that is what I believe the question may mean or wherever that may be coming from. If the church has not done anything at all about that, then that is not really um, um, Oh no, yeah, you are muted, Brazik, you are muted. Yeah, thank you. So I think the point I was just making is, um, okay, they've taken back the question now, is about how can the church, the church surely has a responsibility for the couple, which I think Brother Bill really made very, how can the church reconcile? This is, it should be after a church has tried to reconcile, a broken and a bitter relationship. And then of course, if we have such individuals still attending the church, well, of course, as Rabbi Radley mentioned in terms of how the church ministry should be, uh, um, should take caution on one hand. And of course, should they still be regarded as husband and wife? Of course, yes, there is no, I mean, I don't think the church will want to disband even when they have that uh, um, roar and yet, unreconciled yet, we are still praying, we will still be praying, the church will still be hopeful, the church will still be supporting them, that by the grace of God, um, the bitterness will go and God will surely reconcile them. We have no right of saying that they are no more regarded as husband and wife. Exactly, Brother Isaac, I agree. That is that individual circle that I mentioned. We, that is, it's their choice it's our job to try to point them in the godly way of reconciliation. Absolutely. I agree. Thank you. Sister Olas, the next person. Thanks, thank you for our bill. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes, next person. I think Sister Olos has jumped the next question to, I think the next one is question three. She's jumped to four. It's okay. It was similar. It was similar, yes. Thank you. I'm not sure if you're expecting me to be the first person to respond here. I suspect that to be the case. Um, I'm not a wife. Maybe I should have Sister Lori here to, uh, uh, to uh, answer this, but um, I, I was in two of the breakout sessions. The, first of all, I was in the older one and I, I reminded the older people that are my age to be flexible. But as I went to a, a younger breakout session, we talked about how some cultures around the world 
make it more difficult uh, for communication to happen just by nature. Uh, the culture does not uh, foster communication. Um, also, I, I would say we need to recognize that uh, there have been studies done that in general, wives are more verbal than husbands. Um, I mean, I read somewhere that wives generally use 50,000 words in a day and husbands generally use about 25,000 words in a day. So if a husband comes home from work, he's used all of his words and he's finished. <laughs> now I say that humorously. Uh, I appreciate the fact that the question says gracefully and respectfully to have conversations. Um, my, my words to generally in this case are to men and that is your wife needs you to listen. She does not need you often to fix things for her. She just needs you to listen. And, and that has to become literally almost a spiritual discipline if you want your marriage to grow and thrive the way God intended. Um, it's, that's not always easy. Uh, I, as a man, tend to want to jump in and fix things. Um, I learned from my daughters, they don't need me always to fix. They just need me to listen. So I, I think this, underneath this question, this wife is, is waving a red flag saying, I just want to communicate with my husband. I want him to listen. And, and so my, my words there, you as a wife, uh, I would say maybe it's a little bit like uh, uh, leading a horse to water you cannot make them drink, but you can put salt in their food so that they get thirsty. So maybe you can find some things uh, in short doses that your husband would like to talk about and we and weave family relationship discussions with them. I also noticed that men generally talk better when they're doing something. And what I mean by that is uh, oftentimes in my experience, women want to get together. They'll have coffee or they'll have tea and they just want to get together and talk. Men do not get together and talk. It's just not what we do. Men get together and do things. God bless you. We go to a football game or we go hiking or we go fishing or we work on the car. So maybe what you do is you find something that you and your husband can do together and while you're doing it together, you sneak in some communication and he won't even know. <laughs> I'm making light a little, but yeah, that, that's uh, my experience is it oftentimes husbands really want their wives to be together with them, but just to sit down and say, now we're going to have a time of communication. And that just doesn't work for most men. <laughs> they, just, they just go like, really? Why don't you send me to the dentist? That would be more, more comfortable. So I hope that answers. But yeah, find something your husband loves to do. And then let's go do that. And in the process of that, have some communication in small doses at a time. God bless you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Thank you, Brown, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. God bless you. That was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. We have the person, another person here for Brother Bill. Oh, it's another easy one, Brother Isaac. <laughs> you take the easy ones then. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm not African. Um, <laughs> And I hate, I hate to tell you this, but it's not an African problem. Yeah. It's a human problem. Yeah. Hmm. Generally, people do not like to submit to each other. And, and more generally, men often 
do not like to submit particularly to a woman. And that is that is true, uh, more true in some cultures, African, some Asian cultures, uh, but uh, we are back to what I said earlier. Um, culture has to take a second seat to gospel if we're going to be Christians. So when the question says culture plays a big part in Christianity within Africans, my words to you would be Christian culture should play the greater part in every culture, including African. Now, what I would suggest that me would mean is that uh, African men, oh, I need to be really careful here. These are my brothers. <laughs> uh, mm. African men and all men, it, it is a discipline to learn to lead sacrificially. One of the things that I've been practicing, and I'm very verbal, most of you who know me know that, is I've been just practicing in these times of COVID where we're all at home and, and relationships are strained now because everyone's home all the time. Uh, you know, at least you could go to work before, but now everyone's home. Uh, I've been practicing to not have to have the final word. Now I have to practice that because I always have something to say. And so sometimes when we finish the discussion, I don't have to have the final word. I, I actually don't have to have the final word when I'm dealing, you know, in a minister's meeting, I can have some, one of the other ministers have the final word because we work together in unity. No, uh, someone told me once, if you must prove that you are in charge, then you probably are not. And I think that may be true in families. If a man has to prove that he's in charge, he may not be in charge. He may not, it, you know, leadership doesn't require you to demand people to follow. Leadership requires you to lead in such a way that people willingly follow. So I, I think I think that would be one of the ways that you overcome. We, we're constantly laying the template of the Bible over some of our cultural norms. We do it in America. I, I have talked to my Koreans. Uh, in America, we are very proud of being independent. We have a declaration of independence. And mm. Americans are very independent. Now, when I ask my Asians if that's biblical, do you know what they say? No, that's not biblical at all. But Americans think it is. So we have to lay this template, even on American culture, and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. We are to be interdependent in unity with Christ and working together. Now, we make independent decisions. Uh, we honor our elders. So, so culture brings good things, but they're always tempered by the word of God. I hope that answers. Mm. Thank you, Brother Bill. The next one. Um, can a man who was not raised by his mother ever get to love her as he should? Um, and can this affect the way he loves his wife and children? I mean, the short answer is yes and yes. <laughs> I mean, God is the God of redemption. And so a man not raised properly, can, God can begin to replace those foundation stones which were missing from the beginning. This happen, This can happen, and I've seen it happen over the years. It's oftentimes a lengthy process of continuing to seek God and pray and begin to rebuild relationships. Um, also, you have to understand that 
this man only has one half of the relationship. The mother has, he, he cannot control what the mother does. Um, also, and, and sometimes may even have to distance, continue to distance him, himself from her if there is abuse or other kinds of boundary issues that are not healthy. Um, now, can this affect the way he loves his wife and children? Oh, certainly, which is why, again, he must flee to the word of God for his example and must flee to the altar to pray and must also invite into his life godly examples of healthy Christian families so he can see how it needs to be done and then follow that example. Okay. Thank you, sir. Mm. Pray. Amen. Mm. Amen. Amen. Now, after Amen. you pray, uh, First Peter talks about this specifically to wives. It talks about how ideally an unsaved husband could be won by the conduct and the and when it uses the word in the English conversation, it's talking about conduct of the unsaved wife. Now, it could be the other direction also. Uh, an unsaved wife could be won by the conduct and the tender, gentle, sacrificial leadership of an unsaved husband. Now, I will, in our particular culture, when I say our particular culture, in our, in our world today, overriding cultures, um, no one has described uh, at detail what a backslidden partner might do. And we know that there are sometimes extremes that, that a person who's backslidden goes to who is unsaved. And at that point, Sometimes we have to consider the safety of children physically. Um, sometimes, so we have to set healthy boundaries, but we must never use setting those boundaries as an excuse to not love and care and live through the vows that God has given us. I think I have a balance there. Maybe Brother Isaac can speak to that also. Thank you, Brabiel. I think you've said it all. Um, most importantly, the aspect of prayer, um, which you have already um, mentioned. And of course, during the course of that prayer, it is the belief of my heart that the Spirit of God certainly will minister to that individual in terms of what other things he may, I mean, he, um, he or she may have to do. Um, but to make heaven, um, well, to handle with love. Thank you. Well, it seems to me the question is should the science of female and male understanding be taken into account during arguments in the home. Um, I alluded to this when I spoke of the first Peter scripture. Uh, you know, Peter may or may not have known 21st century science, but he certainly was a student of human behavior and understood mm -hmm. communication uh, to each of the genders in general. Uh, so um, I, I didn't go into detail. We, I, I have teased before about how in the womb, a male child about 17 weeks has a, a testosterone bath that destroys part of the connecting tissue between each side of the brain. And that is the physiological reason why men tend to be linear. It's why you generally have more men as engineers. And I said generally, doesn't mean women can't by any means, but generally it goes that way in the way they process. 
So it seems to me that using the science is, is an asset. Uh, sometimes we have some tools that are available that talk about personality strengths and the like. Now we have to be careful. We can't categorize everyone into, into four corners or not every, every scientific model explains every personality because human beings are complex. We're made in the image of God. But we, I think we can use the tools that we have as long as they don't take the place of God's word, God's word uh, first. I, I also, we use the word argument here, and I, I, like, to, I like to use the word spirited fellowship. Um, we have one sister here in the United States, and I, I really appreciate she 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 calls her husband her her brother husband and he calls her his sister wife and and i asked them about it once and yeah some of you know who that person is i did not use their names but she said when she was praying the lord just revealed to her that her husband is her brother first in the lord and so she should only talk to him like she should talk to a brother in the Lord. And we forget that at home sometimes in our passion. You know, we get frustrated and, and I thought that was good advice. So I hope that helps. Thank you so much, Brother Bill. There's another question there for you, sir. Please can Brother Bill talk more about holiness culture and African cultures, please. You know, before I start, uh, it's my pleasure to stay on for a while. Um, now it's... Uh, now it's past 8.30 a.m., so I'm wide awake. Um, I will ask you all to pray, though, because I still have to preach tomorrow here. Oh. So <laughs> it's okay. Um, <laughs> holiness culture and African cultures. Uh, the context of a question like this, of course, is that the majority of you are come from an African heritage either first, second, maybe third generation. And so that distinctly affects not only your lives and your, and your extended families, but also even how you were taught the gospel, okay? My experience coming from the US is obviously different and yet that culture affects a holiness culture. And then in working in Asia, I've seen uh, holiness culture played out in a couple other cultures, uh, Korean, for example, and, and uh, Filipino would be two good examples. So I would just say it this way, holiness culture, from a biblical perspective, uh, begins with the foundation of entire sanctification as a second definite work of grace. We believe that God cleanses the inward sinful nature and the motives of the heart. Now that does not make us humanly perfect. And that does not take culture out of us. Um, unless that culture is inherently sinful. But there are some things that we have done in an attempt to preserve uh, the holiness culture, uh, if you please, that, that cross with other cultures. And now when I travel to Korea, I have been asked directly uh, and told directly, well, that is just the way Korean culture is. And that's used sometimes kind of as an excuse for, um, shall we say, a more worldly viewpoint on some issues, okay? Um, I suspect the same thing sometimes happens uh, using African cultures. And so uh, I, I think uh, Sister Antonia Schleicher from here, some of you are familiar with her, shared in a minister's talk some uh, a, a year or two ago, a great example of how most of you are aware that in, uh, I believe it's Yoruba culture, uh, that there is a proper cultural greeting 
of a young person to an older person. And that would include a certain kinds of bowing. Now I'm only speak, I've only been told this, not being Yoruba by training, but in our church, we have said, but holiness culture demands that we only give worship to God. And, and bowing to that extent was determined by some of our leaders to, to begin to bring kind of a, a gray, dark area between are we worshiping elders or are we honoring elders? And while the Bible accepts honoring elders, it, it certainly condemns worshiping elders. We are not to worship ancestors. We are to worship God alone. And so in that case, we, we drew a line to how can we offer honor. Now, in Sister Antonia's case, she offended an ungodly aunt and, and who, was, who told her she was a terrible niece and, and disowned her from the family, so to speak until Sister Antonia wrote her a letter and explained that she did not mean to dishonor her, but instead meant to uh, only honor God, uh, worship God and extend the proper honor to her, but not in that manner. Now, fortunately, the aunt was uh, forgiving, and, and, but that will require some communication. Now, um, how what might that play out? Um, one of the places that might play out uh, would be, um, I have told, uh, we're working right now in the Philippines with, uh, with how to help young couples as they prepare for marriage and the marriage ceremony. And, uh, and one of the things that I, I shared with the leaders there is the same thing I shared with my daughters here. I said to them, a wedding should not be the place where we throw all of our holiness understanding out the door and, and embrace a, a more worldly, culturally sensitive view of how a wedding should be held. Now, I'm trying to be very careful how I say this because I realize we're, we're now thousands of miles away. But I just told, now you have to understand, my daughters were worried about what their daddy was gonna say about their wedding dress, about how they looked and about, and, and I told them, I want, your, I want your life to be the same on your wedding day that it was the day before and the day after. So I said, so just make your dress modest. I want it to be beautiful. I said, I want your face to be the same person that I saw the day before Amen. or the day after. Amen. Thank so you. just make it careful, man. You don't get to talk about this. Only me. <laughs> I'm sorry. It, I understand, ladies, that the men can be pretty harsh about this. So I'm trying not to be. We want you to be beautiful. And, and, and Peter talks about that. He said the inward spirit of a meek and quiet spirit. I'm not trying to be legalistic. And we need to be careful not to be legalistic. You know, I, I have heard, we'll talk about African culture here again. You need to understand, if we tell people, don't draw attention to yourself. Okay? Someone from the Western culture might look at some of those bright colors the ones that I had in my slide presentation, the ones that Sister Stella loves to have on her quilts. That's right, isn't it, Sister Stella? Some, when you, if you wear those on your head and you wear those, some people might say, you don't want to draw attention to yourself? <laughs> and now, now, I, now I am willing to give room for that, say, oh, that's African culture as long as it's matched with a, a meek and a quiet spirit, okay? And, it, and so I'm just saying there's a balance that we have to be careful. I, I have told my Asian folks, no, our holiness culture, particularly in the area of jewelry, says that we don't wear it unless it's functional. That's true in Korean culture. That's true in African culture. 
that's true in American culture. And, and it crosses with all of those cultures. It's not just African. Many places it crosses. And we just have to say, what culture are we going to embrace? So I think I beat that one to death. I think that's okay. <laughs> um, sorry, Brad Bill, um, just to come in. I know you spoke to me earlier on about your other engagement. Um, and you said you were just going to be with us just a little longer. So um, I just wanted to say that, please, if, if it's time for you to leave, we're very, very willing that um, you take your leave so you don't miss your other engagement. Um, but if, if you want to continue, by all means, I understand we have just one more question to go anyway. So I, I just felt I should, I should say that. Thank you for being so gracious, Brother Francis, and all of you for staying. Um, as I told you, I love, I love Jesus, I love my family, and I love cultures. I love this. I love being able to interact because it not only make, this makes me a better pastor because I hear your perspectives and I see your questions. And this enables me to, to hopefully speak to the challenges that we're facing as, as older and younger people in the apostolic faith. So I can stay a while longer. We're fine. God bless you. Ah, yes. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Any advice for the children or young person on how they can relate with their parents when it comes to disagreements? Mm. Hmm. When you know your parents are wrong. Well, let me speak to two or three things here. Uh, first of all, my, my observation with my own children is that when, I, when they were teenagers, now my children are now in their, almost in the 30s. My youngest is about to turn 30 next month. Uh, the oldest is about to turn 40 next year. So, but when they were in their teens, Sister Lori and I seemed to be in the wrong quite a bit. When they moved into their 20s, we were in the wrong quite a bit less. By the time they are now in their 30s and raising their own children, mm -hmm. Sister Lori and I are getting quite wise. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, they, they think that we're really smart. Mm -hmm. Now, I say that kind of humorously, and, and I only say that to tell the children and young person that your perspective will also change. Mm -hmm. You will also be an experience and yes. you you will find two things yeah. you will find one there yes. are some things your parents did not do right yeah. and you will want to do your best to correct it in your raising your children mm -hmm. oh, bless you. second you will also find that there are some things that your parents did right and you didn't realize it at the time mm -hmm. so you will find both of those so i'll speak to that first but now the more practical advice, how do you relate to your parents when it comes to disagreements? Um, one of the things that I tell both parents and children is, and, and you heard me allude to it earlier, you need to learn the grain of the wood. If you are a woodworker, you know that, that if you cut a piece of wood against the grain, mm. it, it cuts more, more difficultly. Yeah. It is not easy to manage. It doesn't mm -hmm. sand as well. It, it's just more difficult. Mm. So as, as young, a, a young person who is beginning to grow needs to become a student of their parents. They need to find the best time to talk to them about an issue. I learned in dealing with my teenage son that we never had any discussions after 9.30 p.m. at night because basically my son was unreasonable after that hour. His emotions were just out of control. I, I'm sorry. Uh, you may, as a young person, find out that the half an hour after your dad comes home from work or gets off of his Zoom call is not the time you should bring him 
your problems because his body may be home, but his mind is not home yet. It's still working. Um, you, you, it's, like, it's like bringing your problem to the pastor at church 30 minutes before the morning meeting. The morning service. It's like, that's just not a good thing. The pastor is focused on something else. He wants to help you, but that's not good timing. So you can learn first some timing. Uh, you know, wives learn this all the time. Even, you know, even though the, the story in the Bible is, uh, is convoluted because it was, it was about man manipulating a husband, the story of Jacob and Esau lets you know that, he, that uh, the mother knew how to please the husband and how to get what she wanted. Now, I'm not, she used it wrongly, but, but you know, if, he, if your father happens to love cherry pie, well, stop by the grocery or the bakery on the way home from school and buy some cherry pie if you have a hard discussion and say, Dad, I, I want to sit down tonight after dinner with some cherry pie and talk. Now, probably your father's not stupid. <laughs> Maybe he'll <laughs> figure out, oh, well, something's pie. up. <laughs> but but uh, the other thing is you can pray for your parents. That's it. Also, ultimately, and I tell parents and children this all the time, you must decide what mountain you are willing to die on. Now that's a that's a that's a a metaphor. And 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 it's actually a, a metaphor of warfare. And in a in a war, when you're trying to, to win a war, there are many small battles here and there. And, and there's certain areas that you need to try to win. And so you may want to go from here to there. There, I'll get the camera. So we're here to there. But you may not be able to go in a straight line. You may have to go this way to get where you want to go because of the terrain between you and there. So as young people, we have to understand there may be reasons why parents simply cannot understand. And so we have to be flexible with the terrain. Um, there also may be reasons why parents react the way they do. Um, I know, I know one parent here that is very, very protective of their children, overly protective, but that is because there was some abuse in their background and they're terrified that their children will be hurt. You can't take that away. Um, I, I'm sitting here looking on the screen and I see some faces of parents who have lost children. That's tragic. The remaining child sometimes may feel like they bear all the weight of the future. And it's true. Well, you cannot change that burden for that family. You have to learn to work around the, the terrain to get where you want to go. And I believe God will give us wisdom to do that. Finally, the Bible simply says, depending on your age, that you're to obey. God will honor you if you submit. And trust me, you have to learn to submit. All of us do. You may think that at my age, I do not have to submit. But of course I do. In fact, now I have a daughter, my youngest daughter, who is a trauma nurse at the largest hospital in Seattle. That daughter has uh, contracted COVID-19 and recovered from it. Man. And she thinks that her mom and I are old. And she thinks that we have to be really, really careful with our health. And she gives me orders like I'm the child and she's the parent. <laughs> but she's a nurse and she has some right and I have to learn how to submit sometimes. Even the apostle Peter, remember what Jesus told him? When you were young, you did what you wanted. And when you're old, they will take you places you don't want to go. You'll have to submit. Even Jesus learned to submit. So you might as well start learning that while you're young. You're going to have a boss you have to submit to. You're going to have 
of parents. You're going to have a spouse that you have to learn to mutually submit to. So in the worst case, you just have to endure it. So does that help? Thank you so much, Bro Bill, for the answers. I don't know, Bro Francis, if there's anything, uh, I'll hand it over to you, sir. God bless you, Sister Miriam. Thanks so much, Bra Bill. Um, I'm not qualified to give the vote of thanks. Um, so I have a boss. Brazik is going to do that, but I can assure you that we appreciate your time. God bless you. We have been immensely blessed. Thanks a lot. Brazik will now do the uh, vote of thanks. Thank you so much. Nice to see you, Brother Bill. We couldn't see at all during the course of this um, year because of the um, issue of COVID-19. We thank God that we have this privilege to see you. Thank you so much. Um, I don't need to say much. I want to believe that on behalf of um, the little under 200 of us here, I think you must have um, heard from all of us how we really enjoyed this time. And there is no doubt that God himself planned this for us. Mm -hmm. We usually have um, different conferences in our church here in the UK, um, men's conference, given entirely to the mental plan and know what to discuss, women's conference, um, singles conference, all handed over to all those groups to look after. When it comes to couples conference, um, the ministry tends to look after that by asking some ministers and pastors to um, think about issues that have been coming to us in the ministry that we can look into um, during our couples conference. Today, incidentally, on our annual calendar, we have couples conference, which of course, we decided not to go on with as a couples conference, and because of other things that we've been having before now in our um, family forum or family discussion. So we decided that we should um, just make this open for everybody, turn couples conference to a family forum. Um, and I think God really ordained, I believe that it should go this way. Um, I want to take this um, opportunity on behalf of the ministry of AFM Western Europe here to say a very big thank you for your time. More especially when I was made to understand that you have to wake up so early in the morning in order to, <laughs> to be part of this. And um, we will really appreciate that. The, the love is just um, um, really um, overwhelming and we are very, very grateful. I must also say too that um, I asked all the pastors of all our branches to come together to put this program together. And of course, to consult with other people in the church or all the churches and all the groups um, to invite them to be part of the arrangement. I want to say a big thank you to all our pastors that have come together to put this um, um, together, the program. Um, I did ask Bra Francis to coordinate that. Thank you so much, Bra Francis. And then, of course, you can see everything cascaded down and down and down and down up to Sister Miriam, that um, also one of our ministers here, whom the pastors asked to um, have the oversight of all the things put together. Thank you so much, Sister Miriam. And of course, all the committee members that have taken part in this. We really appreciate you for making this um, forum a great success. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Mm -hmm. um, we will remember this for a very long time to come. It's not something we're going to forget at all. We really enjoy this. And as um, you have heard, well, when we get in touch again and we knock on your door and say, Bra please, Brad Bill, can <laughs> we have another time of fellowship? I know you very well, very well. <laughs> By the special grace of God is like, Isaac, yes, please. By God's grace, you are a people's person. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. God bless you. Thank and you. And help us say a great thank you to Sister Laurie that you have to uh, um, leave so early in the morning <laughs> to attend to all these uh, um, um, other things across the um, ocean. Thank you so much. 
help us say a big thank you to her too for taking this your time um, from her. Thank you. God bless. Mr. Kofo, please. Thank you. Thank you, Father and our God, we thank you for this great opportunity that you've given us. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the love you have for us, that you have Amen. brought us together. Thank you, thank you thank because you, you have declared that you want us to be a family after your own heart. Amen. Father, we thank you that you have shown us exactly what it is you want us to, to do and Amen. to live. We pray, Lord, that each one of us, we have heard, yeah. And we will go and we will do the best we can to be the yeah. best daughter, the mm -hmm. best son, the best mother, the best father, the best grandparent. Yeah. Yeah. We pray, Lord, that you bless each home yeah. Yeah. because yeah. what is your will. Yeah. Yeah. Father, this yeah. moment also we remember the church family. Yeah. We pray yeah. that you will help us as each one of us go out to do that which we need to do. Yeah. And we will indeed walk in your will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do your will, and we will declare that you are God. Many will see us and mm -hmm. desire to be part of this family. Mm -hmm. Father, this moment we pray also for the ministry as you have continued to guide them, that as they have stepped on this uh, 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 road of ensuring that we, as your children, come together and walk in your will continually. Father, mm -hmm. strengthen them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The leadership. Bless mm -hmm. all of us. Amen. As we go from here, we pray that you will teach us Amen. to walk in your will continually. Amen. At this moment, I bring your son, brother Bill, before you. Amen. As indeed this day he has blessed us, you will bless him. Amen. His ministry also, so that Amen. everything will work well for him, for Amen. his family, and for the churches that he manages. Amen. Father, bless us all today. Thank you. Amen. As we had in the in the in the vote of thanks for all who have worked together to make this work. Yes. So you will bless each one of us. Amen. Wherever there is hurt, Lord, wherever there is pain, wherever there is any issue. Yes. Father, as we have gathered today and heard your word, you will come and deal with all those issues. Amen. You will come and remove all those pain. Amen. Lord, help us to walk in your will. Blessed be your name, Lord. Blessed be your name. Thank you for your love for us. Let us go now and walk in the way you have shown us. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing our prayers because we have prayed in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Homes where the children are led to know Christ in his beauty who loves them so. Homes where the altar buds burn and glow. God give us Christian homes. God give us Christian homes.